Uh, Neil Kermode is the managing director of the European Marine Energy uh, Centre um, in the Orkneys. The, the world's leading test facility for wave and tidal energy converters. Um, I think the centre won the 2016 Blue Economy Business Award. Um, he's been the director since uh, 2005, has seen it grow from an organisation with three people to one with uh, 47 people today. Um, and uh, his background, I think, in, in civil engineering. Yep. And it seems to me that there must be a civil engineering dimension to uh, maintaining these devices out there Absolutely. in the wave, in the uh, climate which can provide uh, all this energy. Um, I think, Neil, if you will talk to us, um, we'd be delighted to hear you. Oh, thank you thank very you. much indeed. Thank you. Um, I'm going to stand so I work better on my feet, and also I'm <laughs> conscious that you'll be trying to look through my head as well, so go we'll this way if you don't mind. Um, I'll come over this side out of the way. Um, so thank you very much indeed for the opportunity uh, to talk to you today to just try and explain a little bit about what's going on with marine energy and I really want, did want to reinforce the point. I think it's a massive opportunity, particularly uh, for Ireland, because you have got what's it, 10 times your land area for your sea area. You, there is a huge piece of real estate out there which hitherto has been inaccessible, um, but that's the piece that we can really uh, find a way to access. Same sort of thing applies uh, in, in Scotland as well, but I just really wanted to talk you through some of the things that are going on. Very happy to answer questions. But for a bit of context really about, about me and why this stuff is really important. I was born in 1959 um, and when I was born we had about 315 parts uh, per million CO2 in the atmosphere. Yesterday it was 410 parts per million. So it's got up 95-ish parts per million in my 60 and a bit years um, uh, so far. And so we have a significant problem, which we know about. But the point is, this drives me and it drives the staff and it drives the people. We have to do something about this because in the same period, we've also doubled the population of the planet and increased our oil consumption fivefold. And the point is, we need a better plan because this one is really not working and we're going to have to do something else. So except if we're going to do something else, what is it that we can actually do? What is it that we really want to do? So part of this really is about why even marine energy is worth looking at. And the point is, um, interesting is brought up over, over lunch, is that we call it planet Earth, but it's really planet water. Two thirds of the surface of the planet are covered in water. Um, and at last we are starting to recognise that that is actually a resource um, and a place in which we need to operate continuously. Marine energy itself is a huge new energy opportunity. We've talked about it for, for years. Um, in fact, I've come across a scheme uh, dating back over 120 years where people were looking at trying to extract energy often from the rise and fall of tides. Um, and indeed, there's a mill just outside um, uh, Southampton which has got uh, Roman uh, foundations from it. So we have been at this for a little while, but we've never really made the significant jump to make this absolutely work. But we do know that these these resources by definition are in coastal and therefore peripheral areas and therefore areas that are often economically challenged and are often in desperate need of other forms of employment um, as other traditional industries change. We know as well that the, um, the, the waters, we do have sovereignty over our waters and so that gives us an opportunity for an indigenous energy source where we don't have to project force elsewhere to go and get energy, we can harvest it ourselves locally. And we also know uh, that it, it is a properly green technology. It is a technology that is carbon free once you've made the machines, and as we decarbonise the rest of the economy, the manufacture of the machines can be green. But altogether, it really fits properly into the right narrative, and believe it or not, it is actually really popular. Um, there is a, a survey that's done by the UK government, ironically called the Wave Survey. It's not about wave energy, it's about energy as a whole, but you know. Um, uh, and they do it every quarter, and renewables get a popularity rating in the mid 70s to 80 percent mark. Um, wave and tidal are in the mid 70s. Things like fracking, which government's been pushing, the low 30s, and nuclear's down there as well. So the point is, it's a technology which we pick up people are interested in and people want to move forward on. So we think this, is, this fits really well. So if you're trying to do the right thing it's green and it's kind of popular, you sort of feels like you're at the top of a bobsleigh run. You've just got to push and get on it because it's going to go. 
as opposed to you're trying to push this thing uphill in, in an impossible way. So I was also um, in, intrigued by the fact that this is now becoming part of the popular discussion that went on and seeing the climate awareness thing on the TV last night was quite amazing sitting down in my hotel room going, oh wow, um, on um, OTE. So I think there is a, a movement afoot and really this is a, a chance to actually move with this while we do have a, an opportunity. So, the resource itself, where is the resource? Well, I usually use this graph to show where the resource is in UK waters, and at this point, jokingly point out that Ireland acts like a very nice breakwater for the middle of, uh, of, of the UK. Um, but the point is, in terms of your energy resource, um, the, this, is, this is wave uh, energy resource, the waves pound in, as you know, into the west coast, and these contours are organised in uh, kilowatts per linear metre of wave. And it's showing this green area here, that 50 kilowatts per linear metre of wave, some distance offshore and indeed touching the shore. You've got a huge energy resource that's there. The challenge for an engineering um, sense is, is resisting and making the most of it. It's not a case of can you harvest the energy, it's can you be there tomorrow to harvest it again, because today can be quite threatening. So that's going to be one of the technical challenges that we've really got to work through together and make sure that we have, have dealt with this technology. In terms of where we are, by the way, those who don't know where Orkney is, um, we're 59 degrees north, um, off the north coast of uh, mainland Scotland, about 22,000 people. Um, and we are uh, an area where the test centre was decided to be set up because we're just on a short extension cape off the top of the end of our national grid. So electricity that's generated in, in our site does flow into the, into the site. And I'll talk to you a little bit about what actually happened and why we've set the test site up and what we've been doing with it to lead into that piece. So the test centre itself was actually set up with public funding in various tranches dating back to 2003. We built a wave site first of all and then we built a tidal site and we extended both and we've grown and grown and grown. We don't get any grant money, we don't get any central government money uh, now what we, we run on providing services to developers to bring their machines along and plug them onto the infrastructure that's publicly provided. We're a not-for-profit company and we're also an independent testing laboratory. So the idea was always, if we could tell people that this machine did that and that machine did this, at some point an investor will want to look at both of those reports and go, mm, I'll invest in that one. So we've always set out to try and make sure that we're making this something that is actually investable. And our vision is trying to find a way to make marine energy part of the wider energy system. I'll talk more about the energy system right at the last minute because that is becoming increasingly important rather than it just being a single linear partition technology. There are edges which start to bleed into other things. But our drive is very much to make sure we do this as quickly, as cheaply and as safely as possible. We need to get this industry up and going and a test centre was the easiest way to get this started. And that's why uh, it was decided to build EMEC that will allow us uh, to put in these, the infrastructure which helps people bring their machines and get them installed as quickly, as cheaply and as safely as is humanly possible. And over the 15 or so years we've now been running uh, with these, these sites, we've had a number of machines here on each of these different uh, locations. The left hand one is dealing with waves, the right hand one is dealing with tides, and basically they've got the same fundamental process, which is there are cables that run out into the sea, there's a substation on the shore, there's instrumentation on shore, there's instrumentation at sea, and we compare the amount of energy that we're seeing in the water with what we're seeing in terms of the electricity that's landed on the shore. And that allows us to attest to how good these machines are at turning water into electricity, pretty much. I say pretty much, because some people don't want to make electricity, they want to make desalinated water or do other things, but fundamentally that was the model. Um, in terms of scale for a minute, this, little, this is our tidal site of, uh, of Orkney. Um, this is the fall of Warness, this, this site. It's about two kilometres across. Half a billion tonnes of seawater an hour go through there. <coughs> so you've got to be technically prepared to go out and try and do battle with that. You really have got to be ready, because if you turn your back on it, it'll kill you. So you've really, really got to be technically ready. And this is one of the challenges that this te these technologies don't work necessarily at small scale. You've got to commit and go. And this is a, this is a challenge for financing. It's a challenge for engineering. We'll talk more about some of the numbers later if, if, if you like. 
But anyway, those are, that's the infrastructure. That's what we spent uh, most of the money on, putting this stuff in the sea. These are the, each of these cables is about as thick as my arm, and most of them will allow us to land about five megawatts of electricity onto the beach. So that's the sort of just some rough scale. And the effort that's gone in uh, together has actually meant that we've done quite an awful, quite a lot of work, and that we've had 31 devices. 20 different country, uh, com companies from 11 different countries coming and testing machines with us. Um, and together, they have land, they, they've started now to, to land proper industrial quantities of electricity on, on, on the beach, or some of these machines have. Not all of them, some of them have failed, some of them have gone away, some of them, people have decided they want to do different things. But overall, they're starting to see some stuff really happen. And the point is, what we do is we take people through a, a, a very sort of learning journey. Um, because there's no point at all having a machine if you don't know how to make everything work. And there are five lessons that we say that here. You need to know that you can install this machine. Will it survive? Is it reliable? Um, can you actually maintain it? And will it operate in an energy system? And those lessons have to be learnt. And they have to be learnt in that order. You, you'll never know if it survives if you couldn't install it. You'll never know if it was reliable if it didn't survive. And you have to learn those lessons in that order. Sometimes you have to go back and learn it again and again, and eventually you progress. But once you've gone through that lot, you've then got a position where you know whether it is cost effective. And if it's cost effective, then it's investable. And that's the journey that everybody has to go on. And everybody likes to start here because they know that they can install it because they can. Yeah. And then you get out into a boat and then find out that you can't lift it the way you think or whatever. So this is a, this is a constant journey that people have to go on. Um, and it, it is difficult because until people really know what they're doing, um, it, doesn't, it is not a, a proper product. It's an idea. And the reason you go around this loop time and time again is that it's about practice. And practice makes cheaper. Not as if it's perfect, but cheaper. You have to practice to get better and better, and that's exactly what we do as a species. We take an idea, we do it once, we do it again, we do it again, and we get better and better and better. And that is why the cost of things tends to come down, because you spot a better way of doing it, or you improve your techniques, or you find a different material, or somebody comes with a better idea, and on it goes. And that's how it works. And that's not just us, that's all technologies. And this is a graph that shows some power generation technologies. And the graph effectively shows cost on the left-hand side, and the bottom is deployment. It's a logarithmic scale. So this is the cost of, of deploying a technology at 100 megawatts installed, 1,000, so um, that's, a, that's a gigawatt installed, up to 10 terawatts installed. Okay? And basically, this, these learning curves are pretty standard. There's the same sort of slope on most of them, and basically what it comes down to is the more often you do it, the better you get. Now, for marine energy, we haven't had 100 megawatts in the water at all yet. We're probably in the tens and maybe 15 or so. So we're not even on this graph. But that's the graph that you've got to get to. That's how you've got to drive this down. And the only way you drive this down is by practice. And you can see that a lot of these technologies enter at quite high prices. Two and a half thousand, was that, um, uh, euros per kilowatt? You know, these, these are big, it's big money. Some of these machines have not even started there because there's some, for example, gas, uh, this, this one, uh, gas combined cycle turbines, was basically a jet engine in a box. So we started in aviation, then went to ships, and then stuck them in a box and put a generator on the end of them. You know, the, these technologies don't necessarily start here, that's just when they become economic at some point. So you have to recognise that technology's got to go through that journey, and unfortunately, the only way to do that is repetition. And that's not something that people like to hear, but that's unfortunately how, how this needs to work. And the thing is, there are, we have done this in other things. We have come, we, we can do remarkable things. We can do huge technical challenges when we really set our, our mind to it and really want to make a difference. But we have to recognise that that repetition often takes time and just cutting another ribbon on it or just announcing it in another speech does not make it happen. You've actually got to get out there and get wet and do things. So we have to recognise that there is a natural cycle that can go on. And what we, really, what, what we are really keen to do is to make sure we spin up and are doing this as quickly as we can, but not in a state that's unsafe, either personally or even financially. And that is a difficult balance point to get to. But we have done this, other major technical challenges. And I'll give you some examples of some, I think, quite remarkable things that, we, that, that have happened. 
And we go from 1903, when the Wright brothers first took off um, in Kill Devil Hills in the States. We, we see that photograph, we go, oh yeah, I've seen that photograph. But that was the miracle of the age. 200 people or more had been killed trying to do that before they managed to achieve flight. And they really got the, the basic technology right of how air flows over a wing which gives lift and allows something heavier than air to get into the air. That was what they cracked and they got that done. But there's no way would they have envisaged the A380 uh, coming along. You know, having a conversation with them about their in-flight entertainment system really wouldn't have been that much more. <laughs> you know, they, you, you know, but you had to go on this journey. You had to go on this journey and make things work. Other amazing things we've done, uh, we've managed to take that and stick it in a box. We've taken a nuclear reaction and made, and made that stable. And that's a remarkable thing to do. Um, <coughs> we've also done incredible things more recently with wind. That's a photograph from Denmark. Um, uh, to now in a position where offshore wind is really, really getting to a, a point where the, where the costs are frankly unbelievably low. I can remember being in meetings with people in China and tasked with trying to make offshore wind work, um, and they were saying we're going to get to 120 um, euros a megawatt hour, and we all laughed hollowly at it, and now we're at 40, 45. So the point is, we have done serious technical challenges, but they didn't go from that to that in one. There are thousands and thousands of machines out there. There are four gigawatts of offshore wind in the waters around the UK at the moment, and that's what's led to the price drop that's gone on. It's practice. So the question is, can we turn that into something that actually works as an energy source? And the answer, I think, is yes, and we've done it with some machines. The Palamas machine, when that is generated into the UK grid back in 2004 was the first time people were generated from deep uh, water floating wave energy converters. We also had people like, say, Aquamarine doing remarkable work in shallow water, we talked about Tony Lewis earlier, um, uh, an excellent piece of, of kit. Um, interestingly, we can debate what let that down, but frankly, it was an oil and gas failing that, that got permeated into some of the things that were going on with Aquamarine. Um, and more recently we've also got um, a wave energy company called Wello who are actually out of sea doing work at the moment. But the point is, these are technical challenges where we can see a way through. We can do this, but we've got to want to do it. You don't accidentally find a way to make wave energy work. You do it through diligence and drive and determination and bloody mindedness and not giving in. And it's all of those things which need to be applied to, make it, to find a way to get a new technology to market and make this actually happen. And I see a lot, of, a lot of the grit that's needed to make this work. What I don't see are problems that we can't overcome. So I thought it would be useful if we just touch on a few bits and pieces of some of the real things that have been going on, because oh, I'm an engineer, I get excited by stuff, you know, so bear with me for a minute. But this is a company called Wello, um, who are a Finnish company, who have a, an oscillating wave energy converter. And in fact, there's a large weight that rotates inside the machine. Um, and they've been out on the site for over two years, and they've survived 18 metre high waves. I estimate we're probably about nine metres above the ground here. So, you know, built, built waves that would easily wash well over the top of this building. Um, but they haven't survived completely because it sank. So that's actually sitting on the seabed um, off our site at the moment. Um, and. Um, <coughs> We do for the next one. Um, the, uh, the, um, so the uh, so so they had a, they had a problem, and we're going to have to uh, restore that machine at, at some stage. Um, but they but they have survived. I mean, two years out at sea without uh, without failure, I think is a non-trivial. Sorry, it's okay, don't worry. Um, we had core power in, in the water um, last year. It's a, a, a Swedish company. This machine stands up like a lollipop in the water. Um, that was a new type of wave energy converter. Um, and that's, that went very well. They've done some really clever uh, ideas with, uh, with this machine. Um, and I think they're going to Portugal now for the next round of testing. Um, we've had Open Hydro, we talked about over lunch. Um, this is a machine that's on our site up, uh, up in Orkney. It's still there at the moment, uh, but they went from a six metre diameter machine, um, and obviously it's worked by the white bit being lowered into the water. I explained that because I had to do that to an energy minister once. We were having a conversation, I thought, he's really not got this. And anyway, they, they get lowered into the water. Um, so, um, <laughs> you'd, you'd think, wouldn't you? Um, so there was a six metre diameter machine, they built a 10 metre diameter machine, they put in the Bear Fundy, they then built 16 metre diameter machines at um, Green Ore, and 
they put them in France and in the Bay of Fundy. And on the day they were actually commissioned on the Bay of Fundy, the, the, uh, the rug was pulled out from the company. Um, but that, that's an interesting piece of equipment. And indeed, I was we were talking over lunch about uh, your son and the, and the spin-outs from Open Hydro. And, and one of the things we should never forget is even though these machines sometimes don't necessarily succeed in themselves, the spin-outs they create and then the other jobs that then ripple out from that and, the, and then the coalescing of these skills in other ways is, is of itself valuable. And I'll talk about that just at last minute. So Open Hydro have been doing work. Um, uh, this one has been a particular success, a company called Scott Renewables. They were, they now renamed themselves Orbital, which is really annoying because it says Scott Renewables on the back of the photographs at various places. <laughs> anyway, um, but they started off with us in, a, in the top left-hand corner in 2010 with a scale size machine, just proving the concept worked and was it stable. They then went to a 250 kilowatt machine, it went very well. Last year, the year before, they had this uh, the SR2000, the two megawatt machine out on site, and they're now working on this one, which is in the process of being uh, fabricated now. But this one, last summer, that was doing 7% of Orkney's electricity demand. That's the equivalent of one day a fortnight, Orkney was running on tidal energy. Okay, so this is here. This is answering the question that was posed on the, on the work upstairs. This is sort of here now. Now, what we've got to do is get the reliability of this stuff up, and that's the task. Does this work? Yes, right? Is it working well enough? No, not yet. Will it work better? Yeah, I'll just keep practicing. You know, this is what drives cost down, is getting out there and doing this thing. And this is the next the next generation machine that's, that's that's coming along. And that should be launched. I think it'll be, it won't be in this calendar year, it will be in the next calendar year, it will be in the water. And then more recently we've also got a Spanish company called Magalenas. This is a machine being launched in Vigo. Um, the blades are not on this because the blades basically stick up to about here down, there are, there are two sets of blades on it, and that's out on site at the moment, generating the tides as the tides go past, there are a pair of propellers that turn in opposite directions. So there's stuff going on, this is a, a rated at uh, two megawatts as well. So there's stuff actually happening, there's real stuff going on. But one of the interesting things is, when you start to innovate, strangely enough, innovative people come and find you. And that's really one of the big things that we've discovered, that when you start doing stuff, people sort of sidle up to you going, I don't suppose we could try this, could we? And one of the ones that really gave us a buzz to, who did come and, 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 uh, and talk to us um, uh, was Microsoft. So Microsoft came and found us. We got, we got an email, believe it or not, an email into the info at emac.org.uk that said, hello, we're Microsoft, would you like to work with us? And we immediately thought was, have you got any Nigerian princes you want to enter? <laughs> <laughs> but actually, no, we thought, no, let's see if it's real. We checked it and it was. And they wanted, from Redmond, California, they, 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 they wanted to work with us, Washington, uh, they wanted to work with us on this, which is an underwater data center. And the point is that they run data centers all around the world. Those data centers, nearly half of the energy that goes into a data center is cooling the data center. So rather than burn coal, make electricity, send it somewhere, make ref refrigeration plant work, make coal to keep the data centre cool, and the, and the burning coal making electricity bit is only one third efficient, they thought, why don't we just put it somewhere cold? And so by putting it somewhere cold in the ocean, they are, they're able to get the cooling effect, but without necessarily all that complicated com that, uh, mechanical stuff in the middle. Um, and so they came with us, and their, their machine's out on site at the moment. But the thing was, that was great because it was an endorsement of that. Different people are thinking about different ways of skinning the energy uh, cap problem. There's a metaphor I don't like. Anyway, I don't know. Um, to try to find different ways of trying to make this work. Um, and it's not just about trying to generate energy, it's trying to not use it foolishly as well. So this was a, quite an interesting piece. It also shows a certain amount of confidence in their, in their machines, doesn't it? It, it does. And, and, and to be brutally honest, it gives us... It, gave us quite a pat on the back that they were comfortable with our processes, that they, they were willing to put their reputation, that's the biggest logo I think we've seen painted on anything so far, that they were happy to get this out there. So anyway, the point is that if you start doing innovation, strange enough, innovative things tend to happen around you. But the other thing is, um, it's, not, it's not just happening with us, and I didn't want you to think it's just a little enclave, there are things going on elsewhere. So, uh, top left hand corner is some stuff going on in Shetland, coming from Nova Innovation. Right hand side is Monesto doing stuff in Strangford. Uh, Maygen is uh, the Pentland Firth and SME are doing stuff. They were doing stuff near Oban, they've now gone off to Canada to do things. But there are things going on around, around the piece, and this is starting to, to motor. There is activity going on, 
and there are multiple ways of making this stuff work and at the moment we are still exploring the totality of the ecosystem and we'll start to identify partition and niches and find ways to exploit those different pieces. Um, but the point is, these are nice glossy photographs of the big stuff that's happening, but the brutality is it's hard out there. And there is a huge opportunity for the supply chain to get involved at whatever scale is necessary. If I go back to the Wright Brothers piece for a minute, it's not just about does this thing work. You look at Airbus, there's a huge range of suppliers in that whole process, from the people who supply the landing lights for the, for the runways to the lemon soap paper napkins and the seatbelt clips or whatever it is. There's a huge range of businesses that can get involved in this, and that opportunity to mobilise manufacturing at all scales and deliver is really helpful. So, for example, the stuff we've got here, that's a TV camera um, uh, covered in barnacles. So the, the anti-fouling of that sort of stuff is going to be critically important, small-scale uh, products. Um, the surveying type activities, you know, we think of the, the sea, we see it as a, a flat surface, but the, the topography on the bottom is varied, there's sort of geology, there's shapes, there's, there's things to, to work, out, work out. Instrument systems, um, this is a, um, an acoustic Doppler current profiler, which is sitting in a frame, which is actually turned into a very good seaweed sampling system. Um, so this instrumentation is now looking through massive amounts of seaweed. So there are, there are biological interaction things to work out how we're going to make this work. And these are some uh, lobster pots wrapped around one of our cables that's chafed some of the serving off. Um, and finally, this is a plot. This is the fall of warness. This is our tidal site. This is a plot of vessel movements in one 24-hour period at one point. And the point is we're going to need the equipment of air traffic control from the sea. And that doesn't exist at the moment. So there's, there's a whole range of skills and things that are needed. And people will have bright ideas about ways to fill in some of these evolutionary niches which are going to grow up. It's not just, have you got a thing that turns and makes electricity? There's an industry to be built here, or multiple industries to be done. Um, and the other thing is that we also recognise we don't have the exclusive rights on this. We are very aggressively working with places all around the world. And this is just some of the test centres, some of the people with whom we're working at the moment. We run a thing called International Waters, which is the test sites often mentioned here, and we get them together to find ways to share experience and find ways that we can work better together. And we are very determined to make sure that sort of planet water joins together and makes sure this all works in one go, because what we can't afford to do is have wasteful processes. And this is an illustration of wasteful process I took a photograph of in, in Japan, which is why have you got three different things doing exactly the same thing? You get electricity safely out of the wall into your laptop without killing you. Right? What, really? Stay together, join up, universal standards, try and make this all work in one go. So we don't all have to have a pocket full of adapters when we go to places where you rock up with your tidal turbine, oh, we don't do it like that here. That's, so we are very keen, we have a very open architecture about working with people on this and we're, we're keen to, to really drive that on. And the thing is, we have actually had a positive impact. We are already sure that we've had a major impact on people's like, jobs in the islands. We had up to about 350 people working in marine renewables out of a population of 20,000 a few years ago. It's turned down a bit due to some governmental challenges. Um, but we're probably about 150 people, 200 people at the moment. But there are people with real jobs doing real things and, and um, having lives in these uh, peripheral and remote areas. We've also seen that it's become quite attractive with, with, with people from all over the world coming to see what's going on and the university is seeing students come from all over. It is attractive to want to do it and the supply chain is able to make investments in things which pay back money. So these, these are two of the five vessels that have been procured. They're about three million um, uh, pounds a piece. And finally, we're also seeing the infrastructure is getting upgraded once again, in these remote places, this piece of the pier was added for marine renewables to the pier which was for um, the uh, ships, that, the, the ferries that come to the islands. And on that particular photograph, there are four different tidal turbines being worked on in, in, in that photograph. So infrastructure has to be built ahead of need, but once it's built, it can be used for other things. And in fact, this has now turned into the UK's most popular cruise destination port. Right? And it wasn't part of the plan, but it is. Um, so infrastructure gets used. If you build infrastructure ahead of need, it will get used. So the, um, so really I just wanted to touch on the last couple of minutes about the energy systems. I think I mentioned that we're trying to get 
uh, marine energy to fit into an energy system as a whole. There's, there's been an absolute drive in Orkney, um, of which we've been able to partly ride the wave, no pun intended, um, to uh, find a way to change our energy system. And this has been going on for a number of years. Um, and the island group itself has been looking at a whole bunch of different ideas for years and years and years. Um, and so, oh, I missed my pubs line, didn't I? Um, the, um, but the, the others have been looking at uh, trying to find ways to make energy work. And so we have, the wave and tidal side of things has got us to a point where we've got more wave and tidal energy devices than anywhere else at the moment. But if it just stays here, it's not an industry. We, this has to spread. We have to get this out into the rest of the world and, and find ways of making it work. But the energy system as a whole has been uh, very transparent to people in Orkney. We are on, a, on the end of a very long, thin cable. And so we have been working hard at trying to have other energy, other energy elements in our energy system. And so there's a lot of wind that's gone up. And now we have produced more electricity than we can use um, every year since 2013. So we're a net exporter of electricity um, now and have been every year uh, for some time. Um, now that then means that we have been in a position where people have got really engaged with energy, energy processes and now we're around one in ten of the households are actually making their own power, often from wind. I've got a five kilowatt wind turbine in my garden, it runs my house and it runs my electric car. You know, that's, that's just, that's pretty normal now. So we are seeing this prosumer thing actually really happen because people are alive to the possibilities that energy represents and see it amongst their friends and family and it's a course, it's a subject of constant conversation. <coughs> well, see, at least my wife tells me it is, but that's another story. Um, but we, we, we have seen an uptake of electric vehicles. That's starting to really roll now. We've also, in projects now where we're starting to work at how we can put a dent in our ferry fleet's fuel consumption. Um, and we're start, now starting to use hydrogen to power our ferries, and there's a project going on there that is already powering ferries and they tie up alongside at night from hydrogen and we're about to put hydrogen afloat in a ferry which will be happening in the next three weeks or so. So we're starting to find other ways into the transport space, not just electricity, it's now become a transport issue. Um, we're also uh, pioneering work on smart technology so there, there is already a, a degree of interaction with the grids, we know what's going on. But the reason achievements um, is in the University of Commons is we've still got the highest levels of fuel poverty um, in Scotland um, and we're, <coughs> we're, we're, we are having problems because of unhelpful government policies actually stalling some of the stuff that's going on. So the removal of support for people putting in renewables in, in, in the UK has, has really um, been a block on, on some of the development that's really been happening. So we try and articulate that and make it clear because um, I don't believe anybody gets up in the morning and thinks, how can I ruin this? You know, it's usually done through some other, other drivers that, need, that mean that that seems the sensible thing to do, but we try and make it visible as to the impact of what actually happens. Um, but we recognise that this whole energy system, so far we've really been concentrated on this electricity piece, and actually there's a whole bigger piece. Electricity is only about a fifth of the, of the, of the UK's energy consumption. A fifth. And we've basically done a good job in greening that bit up, but barely touched the other pieces. So there are other initiatives going on in the Orkney energy space at the moment, working on very high energy efficiency housing, we're working on how to put solar into a grid that's already saturated, we're working in the public housing and also the public estate. This is a library that's running on a sea source heat pump, it's got a coefficient of performance of seven on, on bits on that, so that's heating the public estate from the sea that's around us. Um, we're working, say, on the ferries, trying to find ways to put a dent in their three million litres of diesel they use a year, um, and the EV rollout and how that interacts with the grid and how are we going to uh, allow charging to happen effectively. And finally, we're putting in storage um, in people's houses and a number of other locations to make more use of the electricity that then can, can smooth out our electrical demand. So the whole energy ecosystem is actually fed by what we're doing and is also we are able to enable parts of it because we're bringing people um, of, of interest into our space. And I'm pleased to say we, an energy audit was one of the most useful things that was done a few years ago. I won't expect you to memorise this diagram, but broadly speaking, the size of the blocks is an indication of what's going on. And, and so from the top, electricity, coal, LPG is very small, kerosene, gas oil, diesel, petrol, marine gas oil, um, marine diesel oil, the heavy fuel oil. And the interesting thing from this is it shows how much we're using for heavy fuel oil compared to what we're using for electricity on the islands. You know, this is a big target for us. We've really got to go after this. 
And it's important to realise that there are a lot of other islands around, so these islands themselves then become markets in which you can sell the technology and do things. Um, I'm trying to remember the guy's name, come back to me in a minute, who was one of the island's commissioners, um, pointed out that in, in, in the European Union, if you add together the populations of all of the islands in, in the European Union, that would be the eighth largest state. So the point is that island matters matter. You know, that they, they, there is relevance in what goes on even in these small locations to try and make things work. And so we're very keen to try and drive that learning and see how we can make it all work. Um, and over time we're working on things. We've now got this largely going on renewables. We're all in a position where we started to put dents in our heating system and electrifying that. We're now starting to work on marine diesel and synthetic fuels. And finally we're also in a position where we would like to do something with agriculture. So if anybody has a hydrogen or electric tractor, please see me afterwards. Because we're desperate to try and put a dent in that space as well, because it is so critically important. So the point is that overall, we're tackling a number of different things. I hope I've shown that marine energy is a piece, but it leads you into other spaces, um, which then mean that you can try and find ways to exploit these other niches, which frankly were unimagined a little while ago. And we had uh, something painted up over the door um, at Enoch, which is really our credo, which is based on... Um, speech by Kennedy, and he said, the problems of the world cannot possibly be solved by the sceptics or critics whose horizons are limited by obvious realities. We need people who can dream of things that never were. And that's really what we spend our time doing. So we are very happy if people want to talk to us, or um, we will lo love to find a way to try and help what anybody wants to do. And it may not be us, we pass it on to somebody who can do it better. Um, but this is what really drives us. So if anybody wants to know more about this, I'd be delighted to talk to you. Thanks for your time.